Can you look at the following selectors in CSS and answer these three questions? What do they do? Where can they be used? And are they related to each other? We know that title class is used to style the title, but it doesn't tell us whether it's the main title of the website or the title of some random article. And we don't know if it's related to the card element at all. And it's the same issue with other classes too. Without looking at the HTML code, we cannot answer those three questions. Just like other programming languages, CSS has adapted its own naming rules that developers should follow. And still, these are not enough to answer those three questions, especially when your project starts to grow. Then, what is that secret sauce? It's spam, the most popular naming convention in CSS. Let's look at our previous example and see how we can apply this approach. Looking at the HTML first, we can see that they are pricing cards. Each card has a class name called card. Inside, there's a title, price, and a list of features. Let's use the BAM approach and change the title to card title. Now we know that it belongs to the card element. Let's apply the same logic for the other ones too. Change them from price to card price and from features to card features. But what if one of the cards is a popular option and has a different background color? In that case, we add a new class name next to the card called card double dash popular. And then we can add that different background color to that new class name. Also, the font size of the price in the popular card is bigger than other ones. So let's add a new class name to it called card price big. As you can see, BAM makes the code so much easier to read. And most importantly, it answers the three fundamental questions. What does it do? Where could it be used? And is it related to other elements? Next time when you are naming selectors, try to cover all these questions. Also, if you want to dive deeper into BAM, you can read this awesome article. Okay, let's continue. Here's a question for you. Do you know what color is this? Well, it's dark blue. Now here's the next question. Is the primary color, an accent color, or just random one of color used in the project? That's a problem. Without additional context, like looking at the design file or visiting the website, it's difficult to know. Solution? CSS custom properties, aka variables. You might probably have heard the term dry, don't repeat yourself principle. If you find yourself repeating the same values or copy pasting them across your CSS, you should store them as variables. Let's take our color example and refactor it using variables. A good starting point is naming the variable by the color itself. In our case, it could be dark blue. Now that we use this variable, there is a potential problem here. What happens if the color itself changes to red or green? Suddenly, the name dark blue doesn't make sense anymore. To solve this, avoid naming variables based on their literal value. Instead, name them according to their purpose. For example, if this color is a primary color of our project, we can name the variable primary color. Now, even if the color changes to green or any other color, variable name still makes sense. Based on this logic, let's refactor all parts of the code where we repeated the same values several times. Bonus tip, you can also use variables to store some random or complicated value. It will give a better context on what it is. Writing comments. Either you like it or hate it. But comments in CSS are not just for giving explanations. They can also be used to organize and structure your code. But before that, let's first start with the intended use case, adding explanations. It could be a little bit hard to read when you first come across something like this. And so one option is to use a custom property to replace it with. So we're not too worried about how this part is working. We just know that if we adjust that min column size, that we can adjust how it's going to be working and we can keep on going from there. And if you feel the need to, we could add a comment to make this more clear as well. Take a look at the following code. Without comments, can you tell me what it does? How about now? Just kidding, but seriously, how about now? I know that we all hate writing comments in our code, but if it's the only thing you can understand, try to give at least some explanations. Trust me, otherwise you will forget it eventually. You can also ask ChatGPT to give a short and clean comment on how your code works. Now let's move to the second use case, organizing and grouping your code with comments. If you are working with a single CSS file, you might already know that it gets messy real quick and it becomes a nightmare, especially when you're trying to find that one selector. So grouping similar or related blocks makes your file and life much easier. 
Let's take our previous example and apply this approach. In our case, we can separate the global styles and group them in one place, ideally at the top of our file. I will explain later why. Next, we can separate components that we used in our project and group them together. Now finally, our main cards. Since we organized them by their name, we can now easily group them into one place and make it easy to separate them from the rest of the code. If you are not sure about how to actually structure your CSS, you can use the 7-1 approach to understand where each piece of your code belongs to. Although it's designed for SAS folders, you can apply the architecture itself into your single CSS file. Also, when you are separating blocks, make it easy for your eyes to spot them. I use this commenting approach by Harry Roberts in his CSS guidelines, and they look clean too. Don't use HTML elements as selectors, like h1, paragraph, and button. You are only allowed to use them when you are applying global styles. But if it's something specific, always use classes. Even if it feels like an extra step, you will sense yourself in the future. And speaking of HTML elements, don't use ID selectors. You might have already heard the term specificity. If you haven't, basically every selector has its own specificity or importance score. You can view it in VS Code by hovering over the selector. The higher the score, the more important it is, which means it becomes much difficult to override its style with other lower scored selectors. You might think it's a good thing, but it's not often the case. If you look at habit number 3, we put the general styles at the top of the file, and components, utilities, and other specific styles are placed at the bottom. It's because general styles are later overwritten by specific styles. In CSS, whichever style is applied last will be used, and in our case, if we use an ID selector somewhere in CSS and later down the page try to override its style with a class name, it doesn't work, because the specificity of an ID selector is higher than of a class selector. Also, important falls in the same category. Don't use it unless absolutely necessary, such as for debugging and testing why your style is not being applied to your element. On a similar note, don't nest or chain selectors. It also increases the specificity score and makes it harder to maintain. Instead, give it a separate class name. If you are unsure about what to name it, refer to habit number one. If you are only using pixels in your CSS, either you are a beginner or living under the rock, because you are missing out on so many cool features that other units can offer. And it's important to understand where to use them effectively. Here's my general approach on using units in CSS for different cases. For font sizes, use RAM, because it's proven to work better than other units, including pixel. You can read it here, here, and here. For width and height, it's quite tricky. If it's a really specific number, use RAM. If it's not the case, you can use percentage, because they work really well most of the time. Viewport units, like VW and VH, can also be good, depending on the use case but I often face overflow issues with them, so be careful. But if you are controlling the width of a paragraph or text, CH is often a good option. It stands for characters, which means you can specify how many characters you want per line. For paddings, margins, and gaps, if you want consistent outputs that doesn't change and fail, use RAM. If you want them to change based on font size, M works really well. M unit depends on the font size of the nearby content. You can leverage it to create responsive spacing with fluid font sizes as well. If you are dealing with very small sizes like 4 pixel or 8 pixel where the difference is not that noticeable, you can use pixel because 0.125 frame or 0.375 frame might be difficult to understand at first sight compared to 2 pixel or 6 pixel. All these units can be overwhelming especially if you want consistent approach in your CSS. But learning to adapt to different solutions can be a game changer when you understand where to use them. And that's pretty much it. Hope you find this video helpful. If you ever struggle with how to write CSS, you can always come back to this video. And of course, there are so many ways of writing CSS and only limit is your imagination. Thanks to all developers and their awesome articles, I just gathered them all from years of learning into one hopefully useful video for you. And as always, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.